Um, okay, so let's go ahead and do quick intros. Um, for those of you here yesterday, I'm Dave DeBoard. I'm a recovering film professor and also a filmmaker, <laughs> screenwriter, producer, et cetera, et cetera. Please introduce yourself. Oh, well, thanks so much. I'm a director. I've been also live producing for a little more than six years from documentary to narrative, like the Golden Age. And I also run the Paris International Film Festival. And I have been working since its launching on Cancer is the TV equivalent of this amazing festival, Cancer Festival. It's great to meet you all. And your name? I'm Jenna. Jenna. <laughs> I'm French American. I'm not French, but yeah, it's an American name, so that's cool. Right. And I'm Tony Armour. I think I met a couple people yesterday. Uh, I am the film commissioner for St. Pete Clearwater, Florida. I uh, also founded the Sunscreen Film Festival, which we're putting on your workshops this year. So feel free to tag Sunscreen Film Festival in any of your social media posts. I always forget to do that. I'm bad at social media. <laughs> remember, to, remember to put that out there. I'm also a uh, Filmmaker, producer, director, I've done a variety of things over the years from feature films to documentaries and just about everything in between, basically. That's about it. All right. And, um, well, they kind of know me. I'm Mark Lindsay. Um, been in the industry for over 35 years. I'm more on the business side sales, distribution, PR, finance. I used to run international for Miramax, spelling films. Some of the films I've worked on have been Chicago, Sin City, Spy Kids 1, 2, and 3. Uh, all the other ones know it. Um, but I'm on the business side. So I'm the kind of guy if you're pitching to, I'm going to look at it and evaluate and say, I can sell that, I can not sell that. Now I run my own company called Feature Film Consultants. Um, I'm actually advising and helping people like you put together packages, working with film festivals, also uh, lecturing on producing. That's it. Awesome. Uh, and before we get started, just another reminder, tomorrow it is at 10 a.m. It was going to be in the afternoon, but we needed to switch it. So it's at 10 a.m. tomorrow for the Pitch Fest. Please come out with a pitch to, to hit our speakers with, and uh, that'll be exciting. Okay, there, is a part, there is a part two Pitch Fest. And there is a part two that will happen on the 14th. Right. Awesome. So I won't be on tomorrow, but I'll be on the 14th. Yeah. Same. Yeah. So, okay, so I'm going to start with you, Jenna. Um, before we drill down even deeper and more specifically, just give me one key to pitching that you found and why is that key, one? I think you have to be extremely prepared. And at the same time, be really ready to adapt to the person in front of you. I think you have to be extremely prepared because if the person is like, oh, I love your ID, do you have a one sheet? Do you have cast IDs? Do you have locations? Do you have like financing? You just need to be ready. At the same time, you also want to be able to adapt. For instance, let's say the person is like, this is a rom-com. The, the person says, we don't do rom-coms. Like you said, right? You know what you can sell and can't sell. You have to be like, okay, maybe I have another idea. You know? Don't be like unprepared. It's going to look really professional if you have a full things ready. For instance, if you're working on a feature film or a short film, you know, and you have a pitch, make sure you already come prepared. Make sure you have locations in mind. So for instance, for the golden age, I funded it a lot by myself, really, and just with my own money, but also with some investors. So when I came to them, I had a lot ready. I knew how much of the budget was raised. I had the 35 locations all prepared, um, also distributors in mind, um, cast, everything, literally. So as much as you can, if you can come to them and be like, okay, we have all of this ready, we just need that, and then we can go, that's going to look really good. Well, uh, let me stay on that just for a second. So like, practically speaking, what does that mean? Like, yeah, be organized. Preparation. Go. Yeah, of course, but, but like, a notebook, a file on a computer, like, what do you, what, what, what do you suggest yeah. as far as them, you know, organizing and, and, and scheduling and having their stuff together? Ideally, a log line, a short synopsis, a longer synopsis. I know it sounds like a lot, but it's so important, really. And then pictures of the locations, that's quite important. Commissioners you work with, um, your cast, not just ideas, but also like, you know, over options is really important. So basically a lot of... But like on a computer, file, file, is fine, Excel, yeah. work. Word, anything? I think if you if it's okay to also put it in a nice presentation, you know, mm -hmm. like a brochure, but like a detailed one, that's always nice mm -hmm. to kind of like be more elegant to pre to present. But you know, Excel more is fine too, or cool. PowerPoint. Cool. All right, Tony. Same question. One, one key. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what else you got? 
One key and why? Uh, what else you got? Because so they may or may not like what you're saying. They're like, ah, that's all right. What else you got? And so have four other what else you got that you can answer that question. It might be this is my one passion project I've been working since two years old. That this is the only story I want to tell. Maybe they don't want to tell that story. So what else you got? So you know you just have to have other options that they may be interested in. Like you know, if you they don't like romantic comedies, you have horror film, you have action film, you have you know like just whatever. What else you got? And if you can spread it around genres, um, that helps. Uh, that helps quite a bit as well. Uh, you know when you're uh, well, I'll save this for later. I'll stick to that question and then we'll move on to other things. Right. I was going to start going into the pitch deck thing because you were yeah. talking about that a little bit, but, no, I'm, but sure, let, I'm sure hit, that'll be an upcoming question. Yeah, that, let's hit that yeah. uh, just a little bit. Okay, Mark, right. give us one, one key and why. Keep it short and sweet. I don't want to sit there and listen to your whole freaking movie for 10 <laughs> minutes. I get glassy eyed. You know, keep it short and sweet. And I'll tell you if I'm interested or not. You know, And then I guess I'll give them another one at A, one B. Get thick skin because you're going to get told low if you know a lot. And that doesn't mean it doesn't, it's not a good idea. It just means it's not right for me. It'd be good for him, but it's not right for me. So that, those are the two things that I get. So. Cool. All right. Um, next question. By the way, I want you guys to ask some questions too later. Um, so I'll just I'll, I'll keep this going for now, but come up with some good questions. Okay. Next question is talk about the first 15 seconds of a pitch. At the first minute, at the first five minutes, literally the first 15 seconds. Mark, let me start. I, I, it goes to my short and, uh, yeah, short and sweet. You want to leave them always wanting more, was the saying, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was a little, so um, if I want more, I'll tell you, I'm like, well, that's interesting. Let's talk about it. You know, that's what you want. And you've got to read the people, too. There's a big, and, and it's in the sales. I know it goes up to the business side, but if I'm sitting back and I'm relaxed, I'm, if I'm sitting up and I'm getting engaged, and if you see that, great. But if I'm looking down on my phone, move on. You know, he's not giving you attention. And that's un unfortunately what you have going on today is that people are trying to multitask. And don't waste your time. Now you got to work on your pitch. You got to play with it, right? But if you're seeing that nothing's happening, thank you very much for your time. You move on. Because it, it it may not be now, but it may be later that I come back and work, mm -hmm. right? So it's not always the film now. It's the film that's coming out. Yeah, hopefully don't, you're, don't you're burn in the long. Bridges. Hopefully yeah. you're in the long game, right? Yeah. I mean, all right. Talk mechanically, the first 15 seconds mechanically, break that down. What does that look like? Yeah, so the first 15 seconds, I mean, really just get your log line out. Yeah. And a log line that'll like grab somebody and that they'll be like, like you said, that they'll, that they'll lean forward. And I know this maybe is basic sort of to anybody's communications maker, communications maker, you know, talking with energy and eye contact and smiling and being engaged and, you know, like really kind of like being in the room. It's like, okay, I got a great story for you. Here we go. Uh, Terminal Eel's single mom is recruited by a mysterious former government agent to assassinate the leader of a human trafficking ring for the promise of a better future for herself. I can sell that. <laughs> and, and, then, and then, you know, and then literally pause, wait and see what the reaction is. If they get a little bit before, they're like, oh, okay. Then you can kind of go into the, next, the rest of the pitch and give them sort of, and I use, I use that log on that pitch because that's a film that I'm, making right now, I've got fully financed and tax credits and pre-sales. Let's talk. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so we'll, we'll, we'll chat after, <laughs> after this. I wasn't pitching him, but he got me. But I was using that as an example, and you know, just kind of how to get that first 15 seconds, be like, oh, all right, and then go from there, you know? Yeah, you're good. Wow. <laughs> he is good. Jenna, you're good as well. First 15 seconds, what happens? Um, what do you do? Only the first 15 seconds, what I like is to have a visual. So it doesn't have to be an image, but it can be, for instance, hey, for instance, something I'm working on right now for a producer, it's basically million dollar baby in the cuisine, the old cuisine world. That's actually five seconds. But then people are like, oh, okay, but immediately you have images in your mind. I can of like that. I think the log line is great. But depending on your genre, if you have, you know, imagine if someone is noisy and they, you know, you may just be exchanging business cards. I think that's pretty cool to use. I would really like that. Because then immediately you're like, oh, they see the universe around them. Mm -hmm. That's pretty nice. What, I, what I'd also say, Dave, is that um, in this industry, people like to talk about themselves. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah. A good way is to research who you're going to first and go, oh, yeah. you made this film. I'm so happy to meet you. I love the Golden Door. Wow. How would you get that together? And let her go into that and say, well, this is what my idea I want to do. And once you have her hooked into that, then they care about you. 
They care that you actually did the research to find out what they had done, right? So I think that's a big step in helping you to break down some of those barriers. Instead of, and I wouldn't come and say, well, I'm a student here. You're not a student now. You're working. You're a producer. You're trying to sell a film and an idea and a package. So that's what you are. So it's all about how you package yourself. Tony, I'm going to make it even more constricting for you. Forget 15 seconds. What's the first thing they should do? The first thing. They begin, what do you recommend they do? When they begin with them. The very first thing. Um, you have a minute. Go. I suppose, honestly, it depends on what the pitching scenario is. If it's a formal, you're meeting someone at their office, going in a room, you're meeting for coffee, and you're sitting down, and they know that you're going to be pitching them something, that's one thing. Or you're here at the Cannes Film Festival, you're hanging out in the lawn in the Grand, and you're having a drink, and you just happen to be talking to the person next to you, and somehow it comes around to you being able to pitch whatever your, your idea is. So I think differentiating what those two are, because those are going to be, those are going to be different. The, you know, either one, that preparation is key, knowing what your story is. If it's that formal sit down pitch, you want to be prepared, you want to have your deck, you know, whether it's printed out or a PDF that you can send or, um, but if it's, um, you know, if it's that impromptu kind of thing, then that comes down to sort of, you know, interpersonal relationships and how you communicate with people. So the very first thing, I mean, it's, hard to say what the first thing is, but it's really just having good energy when you're talking to somebody, and I mean, it really just boils down to that personal communication stuff. It has nothing to do with your pitch, but the first thing is, do they like you? And if they like you, they'll be interested in talking to you more. And how do you know if they like you? Again, smiling, eye contact, how you doing? You know, what's your name? My name is, I mean, super simple things that you would think, but you'd be surprised at the number of times I've been somewhere at an event, or American Film Market's a great example, when they used to let people in the lobby at the Lowe's Hotel there. People would just stand around with their, with their DVD or their, their <laughs> card like this, like looking, and they're looking, at, they're looking for people's badges, like who can they attack, and they'll just like, <laughs> they'll literally like so sprint, they'll sprint right up to you and be like, hey, my name is so-and-so, and I've got a great idea for a movie, it's a da-da-da-da, and you're just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Like I've never even, met you before, or you know, or you're having a drink and somebody's looking at your badge and they're like, hey, I got you know, and they just go right into their pitch without even, you know, any soft introductions, you know, it's kind of like, it's off-putting and it immediately puts a wall up between the person pitching and the person being pitched because nobody wants to be, you know, perceived as just being used for, for their connections, who they are, their business, or, you know, in any aspect of life. And so, you know, business, it's the, it's the same, same kind of thing, basically. Um, what if there are multiple people in the room, you're pitching a studio, you're pitching a production group, how do you physically handle it, how do you, what about eye contact, how much should you, you know, just kind of break down those, like, those actual practical things, what, what, what should you do, there's multiple people, what, what's the strategy? So I think you really must adapt to a person in front of you. So knowing again, it comes down to preparation and knowing who they are, what they what genres they're interested in, what budgets they're interested in. No need to pitch a ten million movie if they're more interested in indie productions. Which movies they've been working on and successful with? Because it's always nice again to speak about their successes and and it's important also for you to know their work so you can see how you can connect. So when there are several people in the room, it's actually more challenging because you need to kind of find a middle ground where everyone can connect. So again, it comes to your logline, it comes to like really the hardcore of what makes your project amazing. But I agree with you guys, I think it's a lot about your energy. Usually people at this stage, we want to work with someone really amazing. So the energy you put there, that is something everyone can connect with. So you want to make sure, you know, the way you present yourself is professional, it's exciting. Should you do a lot of eye contact, little co eye contact, try to spread it out? What do you I think you should look at them, yes. But like, um, I think the more professional you can look, because mm -hmm. obviously, you know, you want to make eye contact, but if you can make sure you just look professional, you know, and you also sometimes are really like listening to their body language, you know, are they bored, are they excited, are they in a hurry, you know, if, if they look like they're in a hurry, you can say, hey, you know, you look like you're in a hurry, maybe we can just set up a meeting for tomorrow, maybe we'll be like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. So that's something you want to make sure you adapt. Um, 
I'll start with Mark on this one. How, tone, we talked about tone yesterday when I was going over screenwriting. How do you, tone is so important, I think. How do you quickly establish tone when you're pitching? Oh, God, you know, it, it's hard, right? Well, it is, and it's also <laughs> about, look, it's not only, uh, I'm an older guy, right? So you don't speak to me the same way you do to a younger producer or executive or whatever, so you gotta really figure that out. You know, um, I may be more gruff and, and abrasive because I've done it for a lot of years, but I also know what I like and I also know, all right, you may want to use that to help out, like you're saying. We're, not, we're here to try and help you guys be the next filmmakers, right? And there's some guys that really just don't have time for it. Don't take it personal, but establishing tone, be polite, be respective, um, if you see somebody's busy, don't jump into the conversation. If you see I'm having a conversation with Tony about this film, I'm going to talk to you. You don't, you, don't, you don't jump in because I'm trying to make money. We're working. We're trying. You want to be, be there, you know. But if you have an appointment and people run, and we will run late, we will run over. Don't go come in and say, hey, I've got an appointment with you. I'm constantly eight minutes late for everything. Yeah. I do. So then that's for business. When I'm telling some of the students that are doing their internships, like they couldn't meet with Harris Tolshaw. So we thought of meeting here, it was there. Just be adaptable, right? You're there to get their attention. That's your whole job. So tone. Look, I, I want to make sure you're not like overhyped, because that scares the hell out of me. When somebody like you're saying, like, whoa, 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 chill, relax. Yeah, you'll be nervous, but yeah. you try and look like you're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it, look, you're gonna make mistakes. Everybody's gonna make. Just yeah. make small ones now. Yes. Not the big ones later. In our career, it costs them a lot of money right now. Yeah. The younger you start now, you're like, oh, okay, like, you know, you'll, you'll do that. But just be chill, be yourself, and we will be able to read that. And we'll be able to evaluate if it's something that we're really into or not. And we may say, it's not for us, but let me tell you who it might be for. Maybe for her, so maybe for him. And I'll review you that reference and send you over there. And I'll say, hey, you need to listen to this. This is something that may make you some money. I'm not doing short form content. They are. So be open to that. Sorry. No, 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 that's great. And that, now I want to switch to still tone, yeah. and now story tone. How do you establish the story tone? Yeah, story tone can be hard. So it depends on, again, what the, what the genre is. You know, if you're doing a romantic comedy, story tone is pretty, you know, it is what it is. If you're doing um, a horror film, tone is what it is. But it's sometimes when you have something else in there, and I'll, again, I'll use the film that I'm talking about as an example, because it's something I'm going, with a little bit right now, um, that's a dark kind of storyline. You know, it's an action film, terminally ill mom, human trafficking, you gotta kill the guy. It's like, that's dark. But people read the script and they're like, oh, I didn't know this was gonna be funny. How do you tell people it's funny without saying, well, it's funny? So what if I what if I said to you, everybody knows who Taika Waititi is? Seen Jojo Rabbit and Thor Ragnarok and all that. What if I said, uh, well, imagine if Taika Waititi may take it. They're like, oh, that's a different, that's a different take on that, on that movie. And it's hard to describe. And so part of it now is, so this particular project, you know, I've got my financiers committed to finance and everything. I had cast last year, a good cast, but 2020 happened, cast falls out, I have to recast, we're going back out to cast. People always want to see a pitch deck. In a visual pitch deck with images, look and feel of the project, how do you get that comedic? Yeah, how do you get that, that, that comedic tone? Right? And I haven't figured that part out for this <laughs> for this project for the that tone. It's like you have to read it really to get it. Mm -hmm. Nobody reads scripts. Nobody wants to read ninety pages of something. Yeah, they want to see long line synopsis, the long synopsis, maybe coverage if it's got you know coverage that you've had done on the script. Um, maybe I'm going off topic a little bit. No, no, no. Actually. Uh, since you mentioned it earlier, just go ahead and keep taking it for a second and talk about what is an effective pitch deck. Yeah, pitch deck nowadays, does anybody, when I say pitch deck, do you guys know what I'm kind of talking about? It's basically, Basic, a, uh, you say no. okay, it's basically, it's a PDF that tells what your movie is. It could be three pages, it could be 15 pages. It really depends. Uh, and this deck, you know, it's gonna have like an opening image on that first cover, the first page of the PDF, with the title, you know, and I'm sort of again, kind of getting like you know, granular, but then the information kind of throughout. It's it's images that show what the feel and the tone and the look of the movie that you want to make is going to be. It is the, the, the log line and the synopsis, 
and uh, possible cast, or yeah, I like cast like this, whatever it might be. You know, from a business perspective, a lot of times there's, you know, it has a budget of X number of dollars we're going to shoot from this location, so we're going to get, you know, X amount of tax credit for this. Again, I'm kind of getting into the weeds a little bit. And then a lot of times people put in these pitch decks, you know, like a whole explanation of, you know, what the movie industry is and comparable films with budgets and budgets and budgets and all kinds of stuff. And that's too much. I don't want to see. Then you see Mark over there going, nope. I don't see any of that. I literally gloss right over that. I just, I just skip those pages because I'll jump because they don't matter. Yeah. You know, see if somebody says I'm making a horror movie and the comparables they put in there are Blair Witch Project. Um, so, so uh, you know, all these paranormal movies, activity. paranormal activity, those are outliers. Like Blair Witch Project, thirty thousand dollar movie makes hundred million at the box office. That's an outlier. Don't don't focus on the outliers. What's the consistent things that that happen? And so maybe if you can use tone and style of showing some similar types of movies, but don't give us the budget numbers because they they're meaningless, completely meaningless. So that's like a real. There's more than going that pitch deck, but that's what that deck is, and that's the number one thing people will say after you pitch somebody. Like, oh, that sounds really cool. Why don't you send me the deck? And then I've got a thing that when we were selling the usual suspects, you couldn't understand the script because it was all in the head of Brian Singer, right? So when I sold the movie, it was an action film. We had a promo of one explosion on a boat. Boom! Is that? And when we saw it, it was like, oh crap! It's not actually this is the best film ever made. So whatever he pitched to the producers to get the money didn't get over to the sales guys, right? Mm -hmm. So we're like, eh, and the buyer's sitting like, wow, oh, that's great. Thank you. I'm like, well, you're welcome. I didn't know what we had. <laughs> and that was part of that selling that idea and getting to the pitch deck when he's talking about. There's also, I don't know if you want to get into sizzle reels. Yeah. yeah. Or what we used to call Look, it. it's all about pitching. What we used to call it Miramax, Ripomatics. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Ripomatic is basically your idea stealing scenes from some of the best movies that represent that. Try not to show pictures of, you know, big stars because then you're sailing it that, that way. You get, like, you can get scenes out of the Matrix of all these fire scenes and things going that, and you're not going to see the guy, but you know you ripped it from something. We do that all the time. We rent the music. Key is you never show that other than in the office. You never put that on the internet because you're going to get your ass sued yeah. if you're using all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But you've got to be able to say it's just for marketing purposes only, just for selling. So you can use that, you rip it. Because you gotta remember, and this is the same in, in sales. I'm selling to film buyers, you're selling to film financiers, not filmmakers usually. I put the equation as, you know, you take a horse and push the water, but you can't make him drink. I gotta shove his head in that water until he sucks it in, right? Because you do, you gotta be passionate about it to where you sell that idea to them. You're doing the same side of when you're pitching and selling your project as what I'm doing to the buyer in the room. I'm taking your vision and hopefully getting it over to the buyer. That's what we're all about, is that passion, is that belief in the project, and it's gotta come across, so you need to make sure the whole team knows that. She's doing it because she's not only the film producer, she's the filmmaker, she's the film seller, she's doing it all in one, so it's easy to conceptualize and get it all across. She's still gotta sell it to the film financier. So, it takes out a step, but it also gives her more responsibility. And that's what you're gonna have in the independent world. You've got to be a jack of all trades, good at all of them. Studios don't do that. They have their blinders on, their blinders on. And unfortunately with studios, it's easier for them to say no. Because if you never make a mistake by saying no, right? You don't look at the ones you miss and saying yes and then getting it wrong and getting fired. So that thing the independent world is where it is with starting out definitely and getting these ideas. And there's a, just speaking of that kind of uh, ripomatic, there's a, uh, a Ben Affleck starring vehicle that's shooting in Texas. It's a $70 million film. They were looking, for, they have 60, and they've got all these pre-sales, and they were looking for the last 10. So it landed on my desk, and the people that I'm working with, to say, hey, look, if you can pull this in, there's all this that's already going for it. And this is recent, this is just a couple months ago. And it totally had, I mean, this is a Robert Rodriguez direct, you know, directing vehicle. It stars Ben Affleck, 70 million. It's a big concept. And, um, and the, all these stars, and they're ripping scenes from other people's movies, but this is not for the public. Like you had to have a passcode, you enter that, you watch this, but it's like, they'll kill you if you put this out there, you know, they'll, because they're gonna get sued and then they'll send an assassin for you. So it's so the understanding is 
when you get these, you are forbidden to, <laughs> to send it on, man. But it's really effective, man, and you're like, oh, okay, I do get the feel of this. This is exciting, and you know, I understand. Um, let me switch. So, um, do you use like a, a lookbook when you do your pitch? pitch yes. Day? Yes. Talk about lookbook, because that's that's something. It's funny. It seems to me, you guys correct me. It seemed like the term lookbook until about ten years ago. It was just like, yeah, these are just this is the stuff that goes in it. And now it seems to me like they're actually like, and this is part of this is the lookbook part yeah. of your. I think you're kind of. Yeah, they've, they've kind of come yeah. together. They yeah. merged. Right. Right. But, but talk about what that is. Yeah, I'll, I think a lookbook, like when it comes to pitching, I really appreciate, I think like being visual yeah. and authentic is really making a lot of sense. So a lookbook can include your locations, like literally, not just your gym location, just the location you, you have kind of pre-booked. Um, and anything also from um, the color, uh, how do you, the color grade, the color gradings, the, the, the colors you kind of want to be major in your film, that's just making a massive difference. For instance, I mean, with now the colors are very green, warm, so that's something really nice. We can even, but what I love to do as a filmmaker is also to present some paintings. So if I say it is going to be a bit impressionist, you know, you kind of have an idea. And it kind of gives an immediate idea also of what the film is going to just look like. So that's really nice. And of course, you, know, you can incorporate more images and more references, but just being really authentic about what it's going to look like, your vision really makes a massive difference. All right, let's talk about um, elevator pitches real quickly. Who, who has heard that for, yeah. you guys know about that term? So there's a big difference between like doing what they call the water bottle tour and doing an elevator pitch. And usually, and it doesn't, it goes in the opposite order. Usually you do an elevator pitch, and then if you're lucky, you get to do a water bottle tour because of your representation. And the water bottle tour is you've taken these meetings, they're 20 minutes or less, they put a water bottle in front of you, they're like, pitch, you know, tell, tell us the whole thing. Um, so, but an elevator pitch, real quickly, the, the history behind that is in ancient Hollywood, some of these, you know, big mockers, you know, would come into their, to the bottom floor of their buildings, and these writers would be waiting for them. And then they would walk into their elevator to go up to the penthouse, and these guys would like, he would point at them and they would be like, okay, here's the idea. Blah, 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 blah. Then they get to floor two. You can leave. Go. You know, and then basically if you made it to the top, then you could do more than your elevator pitch. It was literally an elevator or correct or whatever. Elevator pitch, very simple. The best elevator pitches are one to two sentences. Very short. And in that small amount of time, you need to establish three main things. Who's that main character? What's the world of the story, you know, and uh, and basically, what is that main character trying to do, or what are they, you know, well, what's the concept, right? So here's a very simple one. Who, who's seen the original Rocky? If you haven't, you owe it to yourself. It still stands up. It won the Oscar for Best Picture. It's awesome. Um, so here's the here's the pitch for the original Rocky. Elevator pitch. Philadelphia club fighter, man, it's hard to do. Let me just do this. <laughs> Philadelphia club fighter takes a shot at the world's heavyweight title. So let, let's look at that. Okay, so first of all, Philadelphia club fighter, we've established the main character. Because Philadelphia club fighter, what that means is Philadelphia, violent, dirty, inner city. Club fighter means he's in that inner city, right? So we're establishing the tone, we're establishing this, this gritty world, right? Takes a shot at the world's heavyweight title. So that is the main external goal. And for those who were here yesterday for the screenwriting um, workshop that I did, you know, it's all about that external goal driven by an emotional need, right? So that's that elevator pitch. So, so think of tomorrow when we do the pitch fest, you have a minute to pitch, so you have more than that, but it's not a bad idea, I would say, to get it, to get it down to something that's- I have another yeah, one. Yeah. Die hard on a bus. Boom. Nice. <laughs> it was. That's how they saw And the studio thought it was this. Oh, it is the bus going around. Right? <laughs> the Mark Gordon I worked for, that was his face. And, and the thing about that is, and I said, oh, you have to establish the main character? It does. If you've seen Die Hard, you're thinking of John McClane. So you're implying that there's a Don, John McClane character who's driving it because that's Die Hard, right? 
Um, anybody else have an elevator pitch they want to toss out? Or? Uh -huh. From a golden age? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so American guy meets French girl, they want to change the world, but they end up in a village. But this village is some All right. You like it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're on. Oh, you want me to do it? <laughs> you already, you already wow. pitched. Uh, actually, I just, I just, yeah, actually, you, you did already pitch. Yeah, he already pitched. I would, you know, I wish we had a monitor so we could show you guys some pitch decks. Yeah. I've got a pitch deck to pass around. You have one? Of course I do. Is it any good? I don't think I've seen it yet. <laughs> I read mean, it after he did his his double edit. Well, what? Well, what we can pop, well, I'll I might be. I might be able. I think I can pull one out from Dropbox. Yeah, they've got a TV over there. I don't know if we can. Yeah, and, uh, but at some point, around. maybe we could. This is how much Tony trusts me. I'm no, I, you know, joking. But I'm giving a hard time. Um, okay, so um, so let's keep going on again. Come up with some questions. Just a few more things. All right. Um, let's now let's go from they've already pitched. The people are at least interested enough. They're not like get out, right? They're interested enough. So now, what questions should they be prepared for now that they've pitched? Because what will happen tomorrow, what will happen on the 14th is, you will pitch, you'll have a, you'll, you don't have to take the full minute, but you don't get more than a minute. You'll have up to a minute to pitch. Then after that, the speakers will then give you feedback for three minutes. And a lot of times the feedback isn't just them telling you something. It'll, it'll be them asking you questions. I mean, we've done this a million times, and it's always asked questions. So, so first of all, Tony, What's a what's a question that you may ask them after they pitch? Uh, I would have to kind of hear the pitch, but it, you know, I suppose it would be well. Some of the easy questions are where are you at with this? You know, have you made a short film as a proof of concept already? We could talk about that at some point because that's become a very big thing. Um, do you have any cast attached? Do you have any financing? Available. Like are those you are... Wait, wait, you're stealing everything, Mark. No, what sorry. questions? You only know, said one thing. I go. I go right, right to the money. Yeah. Yeah. What, do you have any equity? What's your finance? What's your budget? Where are you getting it from? You know, or, or even like, even if they go, oh, it's and it's and four I'll have, million. I'll have people come to me saying, yeah. I got a fully financed film. I'm like, really? Where? You know, especially a lot of the Canadian stuff. Oh, I've got a forty percent tax right here. I said, you don't have forty <laughs> percent. So you don't have anything until you actually get it financed. Right? So right. you don't have a fully financed film. Your equity, equity, equity is what's going to make the film. For me. Because that's the hardest money to get. First money in, last money out. That's a guy who really believes in it and really wants to own it. Right? So that's your that's for me. Um, so follow up to that, how much would you say you need like to be able to fit like how much how much do you need like to answer these like uh, how, I, I, how many unknowns can there be? <laughs> oh, you, you, mean, you mean as far as as far as the, the amount of questions are just about finance? Uh, no, I mean just in general when you're well, well, pitching. Well, well, I'll tell you what. Let, let's, you know, okay. that's what we're talking. So let's keep let's keep going, sure. and then if we don't hit something that you think sure, we're gonna, sure, sure. but yeah, but no, that's an excellent question. They've covered some of it. What other questions? Someone's pitched you. It's not about any anything that they talked about. Oh, what else could you? What, what else would you want to know? What else would you? You guys want are filmmakers, right? So I mean. If, if you're a filmmaker, I think you should have an answer to every question, <coughs> literally. You, you should be prepared and you should have a vision. So, I mean, you're, you should be passionate about that. So even you don't necessarily have to know everything, but you, have an, you should have an answer about everything if you're pitching. Um, maybe, yeah, I mean, definitely budget. When are you filming? They may say, okay, I'm in. When are we filming? If you don't know, but you need, you need to be ready. And also, second thing, which is very important, at least in France, is Locations are important because if you know you're filming in the south of France, we're going to be, okay, have you applied to the PACA fund? And if you're like, what is that? It's going to look like, oh, and you've missed the, the opportunity. So mm -hmm. that's important. So it always comes back to locations and mm -hmm. being prepared. I jotted down some um, some questions. If you guys are, you can just listen, but if you're taking this. What's the budget? Have you raised any money? Who's already and uh, or, yeah, who, who's already attached to the project it, at all? You know, is anyone attached? Have you already attached like, oh, we have a DP or, you know, we have the lead attached or whoever it is, we need to know who is our, who am I getting, if I'm giving you money or if I'm a producer and we're getting into bed together metaphorically, 
who, who am I getting into bed? Or who am I attaching myself? Let me use a different one. Who am I attaching myself with? You know what I mean? Like, like who, who are you getting me involved with here? Um, uh, who have you already pitched it to? Has anyone already heard this? You know, because it's if, if it's uh, if you're a competing studio and someone has already gotten pitched, then you're like, well, well, what's the first question that comes to mind? Well, well, why didn't they want it? You know what I mean? Like, what, what you know? So they want to know who you pitched it to. Um, what are the comparables? Like, what we were you were talking about that yeah. earlier? Like, what are good comparables? Um, let's see what else. Who's the director? Or if you don't have one, who would you like to direct? Who would you like to cast if you don't already have cast? And uh, and just you know be precise and passionate about it and, and so on. I think one important thing too is a lot of times people will call my office uh, and they'll pitch something or they want to pitch something. And what I, actually really one of the first question I'll ask is, do you have a script? Right. Sometimes it's just an idea and there's no script. And they say, no, not yet. They're like. Well, come back to me when you have a script. I, I don't even want to talk to you if you don't have a script yet. Yeah. I mean, there's no point in having this conversation. If you were counting on you're going to give me this great idea and I was going to give you money so you could write a script, that's not how the business works. You've got to do the work first. And then that's part of being prepared nice. is actually having a script. And it, it sounds really simple. Like, well, of course I'm going to pitch an idea if I write a script for But be amazed at the number of projects people just come in and pitch the idea. I've got a great idea. And so it's why we do a, a workshop always is like the truth about getting your idea or your screenplay or, or your screenplay made because they're two different things and ideas, everybody's got ideas, you know, they're kind of meaningless. <laughs> I, I mean, not that they're meaningless, but you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a filmmaking reality of getting projects made sense, ideas are meaningless. What do you have to go with the idea? When people come and pitch you on the script, uh, do they have some kind of copyright protecting their work before asking, before telling their idea? Super easy. Copyright.gov, like $65. There you go. You literally just you can copyright yourself. You don't need an attorney. You don't need anything else. You go to copyright.gov. You create a free account. You upload your script. Pay for the $65 for the copyright, and you officially have copyrighted. Or the pitch deck. Yeah. You can copyright your pitch deck. Yeah, you can copyright treatment. And everything you wrote in there is done. Yeah, treatments, scripts, all that kind of stuff you can copyright. Mm -hmm. Is that preferred over writer skill registration? Yeah. Yes. Really? Yeah. They, the WGA registration will hold up in court. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's pretty overhyped. It's a way for them to make some dough. Yeah. You get a little certificate. If you're gonna it spend doesn't money last for, forever. No, yeah. It copyright expires. lasts for a yeah. lot longer. Yeah. yeah, so when the WGA registration expires, you have to keep paying your $20 or whatever it is, and it, again, doesn't hold up in copyright for copyright law at all, so if it's copyright, you might as well go straight to copyright. Can I say one more thing? Sure. Okay. Um, also, if you email the script to you, that's documentation that you wrote it, so in U.S. law, anything you create is yours. The only reason you copyright it is it gives you a better leg up legally, and it gives you a better leg up externally within the uh, outside of the U.S. Um, now, with that said, you are David, and you're going up against Goliath. So they know what percent they need to change, and there are plenty of scripts that are stolen all the time. Be aware of who you deal with, and you have a leap of faith. Just do the copy, but don't borrow it. Yeah. Yeah. Who's copyrighted? He's an entertainment attorney here, yeah. so he's very good. <laughs> we pay him money to protect us. Yeah. All right. Nobody wow. paid me any money. That's free. Thank you. That's your one and only one. All right. Did, um, I felt like, did you have one or did you already? And hey, I'll pay you money later. I need to talk to you. <laughs> um, yeah. I have a question for Mark. You mentioned the uh, usual suspects. When you're doing a pitch on movies like The Sixth Sense, The Usual Suspect, do you pitch the twist? Sorry, I'm going to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, uh, only the other side you don't want to get away from. These guys, we need to know it. Why am I going to do this? And then I'll sit there and go, holy shit, that's kind of creative. That's cool. Yeah, I like that. You know, the whole thing behind when we did the crying game was don't give away the ending. It was brilliant. But we knew the ending coming in, right? If you haven't seen the film. So, um, yeah, you, your whole purpose there is to sell what it is. Now, if you can 
do it concise and short. That was tougher because that one was like, I don't know what he used on the pitch of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, here, I'll give you one because when we like, work with somebody like Charlie Kaufman, right? This guy, try and figure out and get in the mind of Charlie Kaufman. I did Synecdoche, which was actually a film within a play within a film. Thing. So you're just going down the rabbit hole with this guy. But there's no way you're ever going to be able to figure out Charlie Kaufman. I mean, we're sitting here going up the red carpet and still revealing stuff that I didn't know about the film and I'd already sold it. Like one of the whole scenes in there was from his daughter. I'm like, your daughter wrote that? He goes, yeah. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so it's just, you, what I find myself, I always attach myself. It's the same thing, you know, because I just like, people that are more creative than you can. That's why I went into distribution. I thought I was going to be a, a film maker right up the top. You get to Hollywood and you're like, holy shit, there's so much more talent. Maybe I'm better in this area. You, you, you see these talented people. You're like, ah. like Quentin Tarantino must have been the weirdest freaking pitch ever to have this guy in there. He's a video company. You know he's frenetic. But that executive that gave him the break was like, this guy's smarter than me or something. Like, Let's do it, right? Um, just find what works for you. And if you're good at doing romantic comedies, do romantic comedies. Don't try and do an action film. If you're good with doing visual effects and stuff, which I know you're kind of doing in, in Kansas City and that kind of stuff, that's the future. I mean, that's where everybody's going and doing stuff on the other people and stuff. So, you know, what works for you isn't going to work for everybody else. Find your strength. And if you find that that's not really it, then change it. <laughs> Go into another area. You'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. So. And I guess, can we talk about proof of concept yeah. a little bit? Yeah, yeah that's good. That was my question. So, you know, Right now, where you guys are, where you guys are at, you're not gonna walk up to somebody and, as a you know, fresh out of college, be able to pitch your idea, and somebody's gonna give you five million bucks to, to make your movie. You haven't done anything yet, so why would they do that for you? So a big part of it is going to be proof of concept. Can you make a short film? And it's not just where you're at level. Like I'm making short film proof of concept. I made a short documentary about a project that I want to do a narrative feature on. Uh, so, you know, you could literally just Google short film so that became features, and there's like a laundry list of, you know, films that became features from shorts. And it's really, a, you know, short films are business cards. Those are ways of showing what you can do from a writing and shooting perspective, and, you know, that's what you, that's what you have to start establishing yourself. Now, I will say, you know, 20 years ago or so, you know, when I made, I was making a couple of shorts with friends, and I just said, why are we making short films? Let's just jump in and make a feature. And we just made like a $6,000 feature film, and it was terrible. But guess what? We made a feature film. And then after that, everybody's like, oh, you made a feature film. <laughs> and when you finished it, you started it, you finished it, you completed it, you put it out there. Oh, all right. So, but that first feature film that you're going to make, you're going to make for, you know, everybody working for free borrow money from mom and dad and your uncle and grandma and whoever else you can get a few bucks from, again, to make a business card. And it's not anything that anyone's, you're not going to look for investors. Don't ask for investors for that movie because you're lying to them and saying you're gonna, they're going to invest in it because they'll never get their money back. What you're asking for is a grant to make this project. And then from there, you have this low-budget feature film that you can start putting out in film festivals and people can start saying, and now you're a feature filmmaker. Your IMDb says, feature filmmaker, not a hundred short films. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that proof of concept is important and that first feature that you want to do, you know, write it to take place in one location or with the around stuff that you've got. You know, we're Robert Rodriguez, again, his $5,000 El, El Mariachi that he shot that then, you know, that's what King started his career. He just jumped into doing a feature. <laughs> this is the story on that. When he, came, when he came to Hollywood and he started shopping around the DVD to all the different agents and stuff, he out DVD, just like, when the film finally got picked up by one that actually saw it and they showed it at Sundance, the logo that the company put on, Sony, I believe it was, was more than what it cost to make the whole movie. Yeah. <laughs> it was a $50,000 logo, the film was five grand, right? So, um, but you, you're gonna have it. Spike Lee shot his whole first film on a credit card. He went in debt. He believed in his vision. I mean, you're going to have... Uh, there. We're not recommending that you go into <laughs> student, student yeah. loan levels of debt no. to uh, no. make your first feature. No. But, don't don't but, do that. But, you know, you're not going to have people willing to help finance it right away just for your concept or idea because you're not proven. 
Uh, yes. I don't know if there'd be, I don't know if you guys can answer this. I know you said you did a few TV things, right? So what, what would be the difference for a series, pitching series? It's where it is right now, actually. Yeah. It used to be the A team and B team. The A team was feature guys, mm -hmm. and the TV guys would be team. Not anymore. It's all about TV right now. It's all about series. So they have a thing called a show bible uh -huh. yeah. for TV. So your pitch deck, like for a feature, I mean you could uh, you could drill down a little bit and maybe some of the lead characters. But for a TV series, the the focus is going to shift a little bit. It's going to be more about scope. It's going to be more about what happens in that first season, second season, third season. Because yeah. if they're taking on a series, well, you have to look into the most TV shows lose money. Like even the big ones, like NBC or whatever, sure. they lose money in that first year. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. it's a loss leader, hoping that you know the second season they start turning a profit. Right. So they're investing a lot. So what they need to know is that this is go this thing is going to, you know, you're projecting three sure. years, five years, or whatever. Yeah, if I can, Dick, yeah. that a little bit of that is, is old thinking too, because now most of these series are done by streamers. Yeah, that's Netflix true. doesn't really yeah. care. That's and they don't. Yeah, they, they can. They're all them. about you. You have Netflix. Yeah. Do you have Netflix? Yeah. Do you have Netflix? Everybody in this room has mm -hmm. Netflix. That's all they want to do is retain you. As long so as you're paying your eleven, dollar, twelve, twenty dollars a month, they don't give a shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they don't, whatever they can do to get you not to cancel. If you look at all the streamers right now, the streamer that has the biggest churn, the turnover, is Apple. Uh, Apple Plus. Like nobody sticks with it. They they get it for a month to watch whatever one series they want to watch, and then they drop it. That's what happened to Quibi. Yeah, Netflix. Netflix has the Netflix has the yeah Netflix has the the, the lowest churn right now, uh, and Apple TV Plus has the highest. So why is that? Why do you think that is? Because there's one show you want to watch and then you're done. Right. Well, there's, there's nothing on there. They got three shows or four shows or whatever it is. They're not you know Netflix spending nine billion a year whatever they're building. Seventeen. Constantly. Yeah. Not yeah. It's even more now. It's doubled constantly putting stuff on there like there's a new movie every week there's new shows dropping every single week and they're you know they're just churning and churning stuff and you have to be able to do that it's that endless game and that's that's going to be the interesting thing at some point like why do you think amazon just bought mgm they have a 5,000 film library that they just purchased that they can just drop right onto yeah. and, and they amazon have Prime. all the analytics and all the metrics and they're not sharing it with anybody if you're a producer this film sells to them Netflix is going to go, okay, we'll give you a 20% big on your money. So it's a $10 million film, I'll give you $2 million, and we're going to pay you over three years. Yeah, they don't pay all at once. Yeah. So now you got to finance it out. So do you want your film sold or not with Netflix mm -hmm. and going around the world? Most producers are going to say, yeah, we'll take the money. Let's do it. Because you're going to want to make your next one and move on. But that is a business. So if you're going to get 20% back for your investors, it's not a bad return mm -hmm. in 18 months. So. Mm -hmm. But for him, He's had this project. How many years of this one? Well, we about five years. Talk about that. Six years. <laughs> years. It actually, it actually was originally developed as a TV series. And by the way, the film is premiering here for, for um, um, Flag Day. Sean Penn. Mm -hmm. I was on that film trying to sell it when I was with Sidney Kimmel. The yeah. Orbit. It's a films project. He had it with Jeff Butterworth. So he's had that for at least ten years. And when I was doing it, we were developing. It was Kevin Costner in that mm -hmm. role. You know, and I couldn't give him numbers that justified making that film because it was just this, it was flat, the whole way through. It was just one story. And it may still be that story. But it's got Sean Penn. So it helped get it finance. Yeah, it, it was probably 2016 when I finished the first draft of the script. There you go. And it's now on draft 12. So it's, it's an evolution because it'll constantly be changing as that goes. Yeah, for old fashioned, uh, we, the first draft of the script was written 2001, 2002, and it came out in theaters in 2015. So it took us forever to get that film made and out. But that's why it's important to have a what else you got, and yes. and to be you know there's a producer that I know in LA. He says that on average it takes him eight or nine years to get his films made. So he has them all in various stages of development. So maybe make it one this year, then this one's seven years old, this one's six years old. This year. And so he's constantly kind of rotating because he knows it just takes that long to get these get these things done. Which is why don't wait, just go make your movie and have something to kind of get started with. Yeah. Kind of on that note, I want to backtrack. Uh, when you make like that six thousand dollar feature. Do you have any advice, especially being from Sunscreen, on like finding the festival that will take it? 
Um, I mean, I think a lot of the mistakes people make when they make them is they send them to some Yeah, they send them, and you just threw away your hundred dollars right there, basically. You know, what is it? I can't even know the number. The last number is it's less than one percent. No, they get fifteen thousand submissions. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. Yeah. I'll hand it back. They get fit, roughly fifteen thousand submissions every year. They have about one hundred and six films in competition total for Sunday after that week and a half. And just to give you an idea, up until now it's been almost two years, but up until that point, for instance, uh, Jonathan Gray, he probably you know ran the biggest independent film um, law firm you know in the industry. You know, he's in Manhattan. So I mean, he's still there. He totally shrunk it down now to back to a boutique. But for about a quarter of a century, he had this thing rolling. And this will give you an idea: fifteen thousand submissions, one hundred and six films or so. Like the last time that he had his full, you know, law firm there, and this is back in 2019. Yeah, 2000, Sunday in 2019. He had he was representing either it was 26 or 27 of the films. That's a quarter of the films. So you think about that: 15,000 films. And I've seen, and I'm not saying any of his were bad, but I've seen some good films in Sundance, I've seen some great films, I've seen some terrible films. And I'm like, this film's awful. How did this beat out anything else? And it's so, so in other words, it's not always fair. Yeah. A lot of times it's who's representing this, and, you know. What I'm hearing know. is 15,000 films, $100, a million and a half dollars. Oh yeah. Right yeah. Just for submitting. Yeah. But I sidetracked it. Oh, yeah, that is. Yeah, I mean, what you're really asking about is, you know, sort of a film, film festival strategy. Just to get well, like, yeah. how do you get your, how do you get your way out there? Gonna accept that business card. Yeah, it, well, it depends. You know, there's 9,000 film festivals out there. So there is, and Jenna, you can talk a little bit about this. So I can sort of speak from the festival side and from the filmmaker side of spending festivals. I've had films play film festivals that have won best of awards that don't get into 20 other film festivals. It very much depends on Who's the programming team? Is this something that they like? What else have they gotten that year? And as a filmmaker, you have no idea of knowing when you submit. You're just kind of putting it, putting it out there. So you know, one thing is sort of do your research on what festival you're submitting to. Know the types of films that they like. If you're a Florida filmmaker and you're submitting sunscreen film festival, if we're in Florida, we put a preference to making sure we have Florida representation, films from Florida, uh, in the festival. And if you, well, even if you're in Utah and you're like. I love, I would love to come to St. Petersburg, Florida. If my film gets in the festival, I will 100% be there. The fact that we know that you would travel in and attend the festival makes a difference in the submission process. So you know, maybe you have two films that you feel are equally good. You get 700 films submitted, and you're like, I like both these films. We rated both of them an 8.4 is what their score was. This guy says he's coming to Florida. This one, we don't know, or they said they're not gonna be able to make it, they just wanna get into the festival. So it makes a difference. It, it can be a tiebreaker. For getting you into that festival, because um, we get a good portion of our support through tourism, right? So, so yeah, because that's part of that's part. So of if we know that you're going to come in and support yeah. the tourism, yeah. And do you do that in like the cover letter? Do you like send a cover? Yeah, because if you're using Film Freeway, yeah, yeah. there's a cover letter. Always write a personalized cover letter for every festival you submit to. Now here's a here's a here's a little trick too, a little submission trick. Um, for the one month or whatever you're going to be, you know, sending your film out, pay the extra ten dollars to be the gold member because you get a discount on submissions. Pay the seventy-five or eighty dollars it is for a marketing blast in Film Freeway to feature your film that goes out to all the festivals. So your film will then be emailed to every single festival and say what it is. And then what you'll get back is you'll get a hundred festivals email you back discount codes to submit. And what I do is I do that, and then I only submit the festivals that give me fifty percent more off. And I, so there's a bunch of festivals that I submit to that I randomly, randomly wouldn't even find or know of. But I look at it, and go, they're offering 50% off, then I'll look at the festival, okay, this, you know, this looks like a pretty good festival, and then I'll submit it to that festival. And so I'm able to submit to twice as many festivals as I normally would by using that strategy. And then again, depending on what your film is or whatever, you may get in some, you may not get into others, because it's a volume game with submitting festivals. And if you only have $500 to submit films to festivals, you burn that in five festivals. So maybe there's like, I really want to get into New Orleans Film Festival. I really want to get into sunscreen or whatever it might be, you know. Pay the full boat to get into those, to you know, submit to those festivals. But then just find some other random festivals that you don't even know about 
that would be hard to research because there are 8,000 on there, and you will find them by doing that kind of little strategy. Just a little tip for submitting festivals to kind of get, in, get into more basic money. And do screenings help at all? So like if you, so like I live in Austin, it's a huge mm -hmm. festival now. If I like post a screening and I'm able to get people to come, does that usually help with festivals? Not really. Not really? No. no, I mean like if you, if we see on there, because you can list all the other festivals you've already played, you know, if it's played two, three, four festivals, like, oh, okay, other festivals are taking this. Yeah, we'll, we'll, you know, maybe. Yeah, that, that plays, that does play a role. When they can see that you've gotten into and maybe even won some awards yeah. in other festivals, then they're like, okay, it's this film that actually has some accolades in the festival world, and this film, which is brand new, and they're, you know, in my mind, they're close to even. I'm going to go with the one that's more accomplished because, hey. But if you, if you play 50 festivals, though, I'm going to give somebody else an opportunity that hasn't played 50 festivals. Like, well, this, this film's already played 50 festivals. It doesn't need to get into another, another one, you know. But, Jen, I mean, so you're going to festivals to see the films program. Yeah, yeah. You go to festivals. You go to festivals. That happens. To see the films that are there, too. So that helps. Would you, yeah. would you at the Paris International Film Festival, would you love World Premieres? Yeah, it's, yeah. The, really watch every single submission. Yeah. People, it's, it is a fun thing to be able to promote. We've got 10 world premieres this year, or it's a U.S. premiere, or it's a Florida premiere, you know, because then it's something like, for the audience, oh, nobody's seen this yet, it's, you know. And also something I want to add about this, about teaching, is that we have a script competition. So for instance, one of our uh, female filmmakers, she submitted her script, and just on her selection, she got a producer, because the producer was so excited about it being selected at the festival, and then she won the competition, so, you can, so that's important. It's, you don't have to always just have a huge star. You know, when you pitch it, you say, "Hey, my script has been selected," and they're like, "Oh, interesting. That's also a nice way to kind of like level up." And if you're pitching your script as well, and you have placed in some sort of contest, yeah. that makes a difference as well. Um, my script that's getting financing was a top five percent finalist in a screen clinic, screen crafts action screenplay competition. The screen craft is considered one of the top three screenplay competitions in the world. And so this is the top 5% in their contest. So that immediately tells the person that you're pitching to, oh, yeah, yeah. okay, people ha like this. There's something behind this script. I haven't read it yet, but obviously there's something. Not that you can say, oh, I'll just go out and play some top cards, but all the contests I submit. You know, that may not be possible because there's just so many projects out there. But if you do get any sort of accolades like that, all right, hey, we're out of time, but you can keep the conversation, but we're just gonna end the actual workshop. So let's give our speakers a